Anna and Walter are young, single, and in love. They've got good jobs, fabulous address. futures, a magnificent new home that they bought for a song. Who says they can't have it all? <laughs> it's gonna be fun fixing it up, you'll see. Some work. Five grand, five thousand dollars? That's just a deposit. A little work. When do you think you can start? Just as soon as your check clears. A little care. Do you really buy this house? Yes, it is. <laughs> a little imagination, and it's gonna be great. All day! Hey, Mr. Fielding! Don't worry about a thing! Hey, Money Pit. If they've got what it takes, it's going to take everything they've got. If they've got what it takes, <laughs> it's going to take everything they've got. In order to take a money pit and turn it into a gold mine. Again, great for reality TV, great for movies. I don't know about you, but if I were flipping houses, and I'm not, I would take a gold mine <laughs> over a money pit any day. That just makes sense. Either way, it's neither here nor there because I think it's hilarious that I'm preaching on this today. <laughs> we know we're talking about forgiveness. Yes, we're talking about a fresh coat of paint and that, that is kind of where we're going with this whole deal. You know, when you, when you move into a house, a fresh coat of paint will, will make all the difference in the world. But it's funny that I'm preaching on this because I couldn't build a picnic table if you gave me a picnic table building kit. I'm horrible. I, I can do the minimal things at my house. I can maybe repair something, maybe. Actually, Rachel does the most of that. <laughs> but that is just not my thing. I can't build anything, I can't um, recreate anything, I can't build anything from scratch. Uh, actually, I tried to fix my dishwasher a few houses ago. <laughs> and uh, I thought I was gonna save money and I was going to install a new one on my own. So I took the old one out, success. I installed the new one, success. A few months later, uh, we got hardwood floors put in our kitchen over at that house and the hardwood floor company came out and they had to, you know, in order to do it right, they had to remove the dishwasher. When I got home later that day, they were just kind of laughing. I said, what's up? And they're like, what idiot put this dishwasher in? <laughs> what, what company did you have? I'm like, oh, I don't remember the name. Yeah, that's whatever. <laughs> because it was leaking underneath. It, it was Jerry, you know, Jerry rigged under there and it was just, uh... It was leaking into my basement <laughs> and they caught it right so that ended my illustrious career of trying to actually install something you know i can fix menial things but me talking about you know completely redoing or flipping a house is pretty comical because i'm, I'm not very good at it there is one thing that i can do that anybody can do when they get a house As a matter of fact we moved into our house in grass lake um almost two years ago and uh, not a lot had to be done to it uh, on the outside or, or really um, anything structurally or anything like that. So we were very fortunate and blessed with all that. But on the inside, we did do something that changed the look of the house. And it was the easiest thing we could have done. It's the easiest thing anybody can do. What do you think that is? People came to my house, uh, you know, when we were closing on it, and then they came back a few months later for dinner or whatever, and they were like, wow, we love what you do with the place. You know what I did? Painted. <laughs> That's it. Actually, I didn't even paint. Rachel painted. <laughs> yeah. Paint! It's the easiest thing we can do to make something look great. We don't like the look of it over here. We just paint it. It makes it look awesome on the outside. What's that saying? You can put earrings on a pig. <laughs> you still got a pig. You can put lipstick on a pig. You still got a pig. Paint is gonna make it look really good, but 
as we all know, if you have structural defects, like in that movie, <laughs> if you have problems on the other side of the paint that are leaking through, that are falling apart, it doesn't, like, what's the solution? <laughs> you know, you, you go to flip a house, right, and you paint it, and then you're like, oh, no. There's massive structural damage behind the wall. There's foundational damage holding that wall up from the bottom level. What do we do? Slap another coat of paint on it. <laughs> no, that doesn't work in the real world. And the Bible says that doesn't work in our lives. Spiritually, relationally, uh, emotionally, none of it. Yet, that's the thing that for some reason you and I tend to do. We paint over things in our life. You know, in order to give a quick fix over our problems. We paint over them. We make lists for our houses. I know that, you know, Rachel and I have a list for our house. And when we bought it two years ago, uh, I remember, well, it was scary when the inspector came through. You know, you're thinking, oh man, we're trying to get a loan for this thing. Uh, please, nothing be wrong. And so, what a relief as I'm walking around with him and, uh, you know, he was showing me everything and he really liked the structure of the house. He liked the way it was put together. We didn't find any glaring. You know, they're always going to find something, but, but nothing structurally, nothing glaring. And whoo, that's, that's scary. So we got lucky, you know, we were blessed on that end, but we still have a list of things that we need to do to get fixed around the house. And if you're anything like me, you've got that list. They're not always easy things, and that's why they're on the list, because it's going to take some time once you get to them. You know, I got some things at my house on a list. Give me some more paint, man. <laughs> Just give me some paint. To... That's what we do in our lives. Because painting over our problems, boosh, or posting all the right things on social media to make us look great, right? <laughs> boosh. It makes us look the part that we're trying to look, doesn't it? it? It might even make us, for a time, act the part that we're trying to be. And we might, even in our minds, we do it enough, we might even think we are the part. But I'm here to tell us, friends, in my life and in yours, God knows different. God knows, guys, there are no quick fixes whatsoever when it comes to the mess that I've made of myself and the mess that you've made of yourself. Jackson Campus, Ann Arbor, I don't care who you are, we've all made a mess out of ourselves and there are no quick fixes. We all fall apart spiritually sometimes over time. And so I thought about that this week, you know, it's like a dilapidated house that you drive by or you've seen, you know, a, an old rundown house. That thing didn't get that way overnight. It wasn't a great structural house and everything was fine and one morning they woke up and what? That's not the way it works. It takes a lot of neglect. <laughs> over and over, it takes a lot of opportunities one has to either fix the problem or just let it go. And that happens over and over and it happens over time. Things not getting addressed. And the same exact thing goes for us spiritually. What happens is the scales start tipping and we get to that point where <clears throat> lathering on a slap of paint isn't going to get it done. Now I love, I love the fact that the Bible talks about how forgiveness works on the part of Jesus Christ. And, you know, if you're new, you're visiting this week, you know, we'll get a, I'll give you a chance at the end of this uh, service to, um, you know, either accept Jesus Christ in your heart as your Lord and Savior or, you know, just contemplate it for a little while. But the Bible, we believe firmly, and we talk about this every single week, that apart from Jesus, guys, we, we have nothing but death because of our own sin, but the Bible says, saying yes to Jesus Christ, that his shed blood on that cross and his resurrection three days later, it, it washes that dirtiness inside of us, white as snow. A fresh coat of paint is what God offers in forgiveness in his son, Jesus Christ. That even the ugliest of walls, me, <laughs> can have a fresh go. 
a fresh look, a new you. And I love that about the Bible. And we can take this idea of the fresh paint and we can go, oh, thank you, Lord. Thanks for giving me a new life. Thanks for giving me a new heart. Thanks for giving me a new eternity. Because the Bible says when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we go from death to life in heaven with him when we die. So we can look at that fresh coat of paint and go, thank you, Lord. Okay, see you back next Sunday. <laughs> While God's saying, look, I, I, forgiveness is there for you. Show that to the world. But at the same time, hey, there's some structural damage here. <laughs> there's some stuff going on underneath, and I've designed you better. I've designed you, actually, for a makeover. The Bible actually talks about makeovers. Did you know that? It talks about makeovers a lot. Here's the thing. There's no quick fixes when it comes to God. When it comes to our dilapidated spiritual lives. I see that in scripture. No quick fix because God has a much higher standard than we do. Thankfully. Thankfully, the guys who came to put my wood floor in had a higher standard <laughs> for how to hook up my dishwasher than I did. Just so God has a higher standard. Why? Why does he want more from us than what we've walked into church right now, no matter what campus you're at, watching on YouTube during the week? Why does he want more from you right now? Because you're precious to him. I'm precious to him. Did you know the Bible says something about makeovers? It says something about home makeovers. Because we, as Christians, when we say yes to Jesus, listen, we become God's home. Now, I won't get into the deepness of how it runs in the Old Testament, how God made himself a home, you know, and, and then through Jesus in the New Testament, the Bible straight up says we are his new house. I love that. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, now when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm crucified with Christ. That blood that he shed, those beatings he took on that cross. Now God sees Jesus instead of me. Isn't that amazing? That, that's what gives us eternal life. I'm no, it's no longer me. It's no longer I who then live. But look, it is what? Christ who lives in me. Whoa. The question that we need to ask ourselves is this. What kind of a home are we providing? Yo. Ouch. What kind of a house is Kyle Gray, insert your name, providing God right now? Because guys, in the end, the reality is, here's your reality TV check. You determine if God gets a gold mine in you or if he gets a money pit. Have you ever looked at it that way? If Jesus lives in you, and he does when you call him Lord and Savior, the question is, what are you providing him? This, the start of 2019, the first few months, right out of the gate. What are you giving God to work with? How are the living conditions? Who you choose to hang around? Who you choose to love? Who you choose to show that, um, you know, that forgiveness with all of it? How are your living conditions that you're providing him? How's the structure? <laughs> Boy, we can go a long time on this one. Are you set up? Is the are the foundations in your spiritual life set up for God's house to weather all the storms that we come into this side of heaven? Is there love inside of your home like he commands there to be? Is there kindness as he commands there to be in your heart? Is there forgiveness? Is your house a welcoming house? I'll ask it this way since we're in the Fixer Upper series. <laughs> Is your house always ready at a moment's notice for God 
to do a work in you, a makeover, a change in his house, however he needs to? Or are you unwilling to make those changes, set in your ways? God is ready to renovate your relationships in your life. And he's also ready to renovate his relationship with you. As we start a process, the Bible talks about many times throughout our lives of growing closer to the heartbeat of God by constantly allowing him to give a makeover. Are you a gold mine right now? For the Lord or are you a money pit? You determine that. Now, you and I don't determine, um, we can't, we can't like make the gold mine on our own. <laughs> we can't do that, okay? But we can, we can certainly allow the master carpenter in to do his work. <sighs> you see what I did just there? I'm gonna show myself to the door. <laughs> Little pastor humor. <laughs> <laughs> are you a gold mine or are you a money pit? I want to focus on that. Camp out there for just a little bit during this sermon because the Bible talks a lot about gold. Did you know that? It talks a lot about precious things like gold and silver. You know, things that are precious to us or they're precious to God too and the Bible talks about that a lot. Now, you and I, this is something we understand. We understand gold and silver. The precious metals that have, you know... A, do a Wikipedia, I don't have to spend much time on this for you to know that they are and have been since all of human history the standard of wealth. <laughs> the standard of, you know, stability and power for nations since the dawn of time. I mean, what do we do? We covet things made out of gold and silver. Throughout all of human history, there are endless tales of men and women chasing after these precious commodities, even to their death. <laughs> so wanting this gold and this silver will die for it. We've shown that throughout history. Entire wars involving nations have been fought over it. Now, again, I don't have to spend much time on the value of this because we firmly understand that. Some people covet jewelry made out of them. Wedding jewelry made out of them. People since the dawn of time, okay, not to spend any more time on this, but have made their entire self-worth out of them. Gold and silver, we get it. God gets it too. It's actually in the Bible a lot. Listen to this, Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom. I love this. As a bridegroom decks himself up uh, like a priest with a beautiful headdress. All these things we're adorning. As a bride adorns herself with all of her jewels. The Bible has a very famous picture that it rolls out in Revelation chapter 21 about one day. You know, the end of times is a big topic these days. One day God will create a new Jerusalem right here on earth. <laughs> and Revelation chapter 21 at the end of the Bible talks a lot about this. How God's going to build it one day the walls are going to be made out of jasper, the city out of pure gold. So pure, the gold is like glass, like nothing we've ever seen. The foundations of the wall, the Bible says, are adorned with every kind of jewel, Revelation 20 says. The first jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, on and on, talks about these precious, precious gems and commodities that God just uses for his toilet, for his roads. <laughs> the 12 gates were made out of 12 pearls, made out of a single giant pearl, <laughs> the wealth, the worth of which we could never fathom. 
And the streets of the city were pure gold, like transparent glass. Friends, gold and silver are precious. Why? Why are they precious? Not to God. Why are they precious to us? Because they're rare. If they, if they weren't rare, they wouldn't be valuable. <laughs> Everybody would have them, but they're rare. They're rare to find them in the ground, in the earth. We don't have a lot of them, so what we do have is extremely valuable. God's got an endless supply. I did a little research this week on gold and silver <laughs> and how we come to get them. You know, we don't just whoosh, pull them out of the ground and they look like, you know, the picture I just showed you, <laughs> the perfect gold and silver bars. It takes a long process to get there. It takes more refining than I actually knew. And then I came to realize that the patience, listen, of the one doing the refining is <laughs> really crazy. Gold and silver don't just come out of the ground looking like we know them. There's a process. I took a video this week. And it's a two minute video. It was a lot longer before, but I wanna show the process right here. As we see the furnace is being lit up. Okay, that part I knew. We're gonna melt the gold and uh, I'm gonna show you this. They have these buckets and each bucket is to my surprise filled with jewelry that we've all given up somehow. And all this gold, and this is in the Bible too, this is great. All this gold goes into this furnace. Here's this guy dumping that in there to be refined. Once that comes out, of course, we put it into a mold. And here is this molten hot gold coming down into this square mold where it, you know, flames up and all that goodness. Whew, gold's done, right? Ooh, look at it. Yeah, we just gotta let that cool off and we're gonna have a gold bar perfectly. Wrong. This guy takes it out of here when it's nice and cool. <laughs> and he cleans it off with this special equipment. Oh, well now we've got the gold bar. That, nope, not done. This guy then brings that thing over here and they chunk it up into certain pieces and lower it into a special pot back into a furnace. <laughs> and that gets heated up to molten proportions as you can see here, that thing is glowing. Whoa, he brings that out and he's gonna tip that over and pour that again into another mold. Ooh, here it comes. And that gets all molded up. Kyle, this is a pretty lengthy process. We can stop any time. No, we're gonna keep going. He brings it out of here. Boom, hits it on the thing. Comes out. Gold, yeah, oh, it goes through again. Another, oh, okay. Whew, another refining process. Oh, now it's getting put into these things. Okay. Oh, okay, great. Still going. Oh, now it comes out and it gets this treatment. Still going. I mean, I cut most of this video. Oh, here it comes into the water or whatever that stuff is. <laughs> and it comes out looking like the gold that we know. The gold that we love. Oh, it's gorgeous. Gaze upon its beauty. And it all restarts back up again. <laughs> Here's what the Bible says about us being as precious as that gold is if we could take that. You know that guy that was counting that oh! <laughs> and hold it for ourselves. God feels that way about you and I. We're precious to him. Look at Isaiah 43, the first part of verse 1 through 2. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. Oh, I have summoned you by my name, by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they won't sweep over you. I love you, I've got you. When you walk, whoa, say it with me, through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Well, that gives us new light after that video we just watched. Zephaniah 317. The Lord your God is in your midst right now. A mighty one who will save. 
He will rejoice over you and I with gladness. He will quiet you by His love. He will exalt over you with His singing. Now, what's the point? The point here is that we serve a God who's literally our biggest cheerleader, our biggest fan. Why? Because we're so precious to Him. He loves you no matter how you walked in Ann Arbor, Jackson, no matter what you're doing inside right now, how He's found you. You're precious to Him. At the beginning of that refining video, look, what you could have just had a, you know, a mold that was made out of anything and then take up airbrush guy and go and paint over that gold and it would look perfect. Why not just do that? I mean, obviously, you did that and then that gold is it's worthless. It might look okay, but it's worthless. It wouldn't pass anybody that knew what they were doing standard. It wouldn't hold its weight in gold. Wow, another pun? Oh yeah. Guys, just like gold and silver, God loves us this much, but we've got to be refined. We need a makeover. Yes, the painting, the new start, the fresh look, all that happens with salvation, but then God's got a lifetime of refining to do in us. The Bible talks about us getting, you know, ultra white robes one day, you know, it's, it's a it's kind of just a picture that's that's showing how pure God is. And I read a quote this week. I don't remember who it was from. It's something into the effect of, you know, the whiter that your robe needs to be, the more scrubbing God needs to do. <laughs> and I can attest to this. Some of us right now are wearing some pretty dirty robes. Don't lose hope, guys. God is ready to not only refine you, but he's ready to do it in a way that will change your life forever. I want to look at Malachi chapter 3 in the Bible. For he is like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. That's like a laundry detergent. He will, listen, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will, this is talking about a portion of the tribe of Israel in the Old Testament. He will purify the sons of Levi. Same with us. He will refine us like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings of righteousness to the Lord. Psalm 66.10 says, For you, O God, you've tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. Oh, I'm starting to get it, Kyle. I know, me too. Zechariah 13, verse 9. And I will put this third into the fire. God's going to put us into the fire and refine us as one refines silver and test us as gold is tested. Yeah, spray paint and gold just, whoosh, you can just, you know, take something and nick it up and go, that's not gold. What's underneath? They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. Guys, a refiner's fire is there because it purifies purifies us just like that video is it over yet and I could have gone a lot longer nope still purifying <laughs> still making it silver is a whole different deal that was just gold a refiner's fire with that gold and silver what does it do it it purifies it it melts down the ore of silver and gold. It, it, it has a way of refining it and separating out the impurities that ruin its value. Ugh. It either burns them up or it boils them out. Yet, listen, it leaves the gold and silver unharmed. I love this analogy and we could spend so much time on it. The refiner's fire, the launderer's soap are not destructive agents by God. But they're cleansing ones. And they're all throughout the Bible. The refiner's fire from God is a theme that you can see over and over. Do some research on that this week. The refiner's fire. Get ready to jump in and let God refine you. He'll do it and he won't destroy you but he wants to make you more into who you're truly meant to be. 
And that can mean giving some things up. That can mean going, I got a list of to-do things <laughs> inside of me that I got I to gotta let God start taking care of. And he'll do it. The verse I just read that I, I said he sits there and he refines us. A refiner sitting there is taking great care. The silversmiths back in the Bible, the goldsmiths, it was done the same way. That's why the analogy's there. It's no different today. They sit there, painstakingly so, and they heat it up in the furnace and they, they watch the color and they watch the impurities. We see this in the book of Psalms. First Peter even talks about it in the New Testament. It was a very intricate process. Silver was even, I found in my research, we won't get into it, was even more intricate in the refining process than gold. You had to treat it with charcoal just right, and you know, or it would take all the oxygen in and as the air, and it would lose its luster. Very, very temperamental. God is sitting, like that Bible verse we just read said. He's, he's sitting there just ready to carefully work on you. Let him go to work. I love one of the Hebrew words in the Old Testament for God refining us uh, literally means running us through a strainer, <laughs> a colander. You know, you do that all the time. Why do you do that when you're cooking? Of course, you want to get rid of the water or whatever it is you don't want in what you're making. You need it to flow out. You got to run it through a strainer. And the Bible says God works a similar process in us that our our lives are a, a process over and over again, listen, of God applying heat and exposing our weaknesses, <laughs> exposing our faults, our struggles, our impurities. It's hot. I've been there. I'm still there. It's uncomfortable. I'm not going to lie. But, friends, if you submit to God's heat daily, you'll start being transformed into his likeness. And it's a process that only ends when we meet Jesus face to face. I was at a funeral a few weeks ago for my uncle, you know, and he was a Christian man and he's in heaven, you know, partying with God. But I sat at that funeral and I'm like, we're all going to have a funeral. We just can't avoid it. We're all going to be there when we see Jesus face to face. And until then, he wants to constantly refine us. It doesn't always mean complete tragedy in our lives, okay? It doesn't always mean, oh, I got to hit absolute positive rock bottom. <laughs> I think, you know, I've come to find out over the last three years that God, four years, that God's really been refining me. Uh, I found that I really needed more of it than the average man. <laughs> and so the more refining you need, it may be the more painful that it is. But allowing God to do it. Not allowing those relational problems on the surface to root inside and get bitterness. You know, God's given us that fresh coat of paint. He's given us that makeover. He's giving us that new chance at life and the rebirth of, you know, that's why we have salvation and then baptism coming out of that water, showing the world, I'm a new creation in the Lord because I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And allowing that forgiveness to then permeate our lives. Showing that to others around us. Showing that love. Valuing the relationships in our lives. As much as we now know that God values us. Like silver and gold. This is not easy. This is harder than it seems. Because in life, when things get difficult. In life, when we come to the point where we're going to need discipline, we're going to need refined, our human tendency is to run away from the heat. We learned that at a very early age when we touch the stove. We run. What happens to a superheated object when we quickly take it away from the heat? It hardens. Oh. It hardens. When we run from God's refining process as Christians, you can run as far and as fast as you want to, but you'll start to harden. Your spiritual life will start to be a dilapidated house. You will grow emotionally stagnant, relation, relationally stagnant, spiritually stagnant. It's a process 
that we have to be willing to allow God to take us through. And friends, I'm going to tell you that as you wake up daily, and I'm going to give you a few, three easy ways you can, you can submit to this process here in a second. God's going to change your perspective on what you're going through. You're going to begin to see less of what's wrong in your life, right? And you're going to see more of the evidences that God is working that he's refining you into what he truly wants you to be, that God's bringing the weaknesses to the surface so that ultimately you can become spiritually stronger, more like him, more of a reflection of him, and that's what the Bible calls us to be. His plan is to make us holy. His plan is to make us dependent servants of the refiner who desires to give us lives far beyond what we could ever imagine. It's just a daily process of falling on the floor and going, God, please go before me. I'm going to get in your word. I'm going to read. I'm going to, this is why we do our version devotional, my friends. This is why we have small groups and we are kicking them off this week. Woo! Because we can be refined. Not just through a sermon or not just even through worship. Not just through the gathering together on a Sunday, but by doing life together. And that's why we do small groups. Because we can sit around, iron sharpens iron, the Bible says, where there's two or more gathered in my name. You know, we sit there as a small group. Go to our website, talk to anybody with a lanyard, you know, get in a small group. They only run for like 10, 8 to 10 weeks this winter. Somebody's house, hanging out. You have friends for life. It's real people sitting around talking about real problems, but a real God who's ready to refine us. Become dependent on that refiner. So many ways around North Rock to do that. version's a huge way. Waking up every morning, we have a reading plan. We'll talk about on the send-off at each campus today. Get in your Bibles every morning. Okay. Let me, on your outlines, whether you know, you're know you watching on your phone there, on your outline and version, or you're, you're looking at our website. Three ways that you can sustain through the refiner's fire. Number one is submit to the process. Number two, these are harder than it seems. Trust God, the refiner. Number three, take that prayer game up a notch. That's going to be a big deal. A lot of times we don't notice we're being refined in the fire until we look back in hindsight. Yet, if we would have been aware, we would have been, you know, God didn't have to refine us by, (laughs) you know, but more of us going open-handedly, God, take me, make me into what you desire, mold me, bring my flaws up, bring my weaknesses to the surface, bring my impurities up, get them out of here. I submit to you. Imagine how much your life would change relationally, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, all of it. If you're walking hand in hand with God through the flames, he doesn't have to put you in a headlock and give you a noogie and a wedgie to get you in there. (laughs) Trust God, the refiner. The fires of life are where we either forge our faith or again, we drift away from it and become hardened. Guys, the trials that we face in this life have to bring us to a decision point. Are we going to run from God or are we going to turn our eyes to him and trust that he's in that fire with us and trust that he indeed will see us out on the other side? And all the while, take your prayer game up a notch. That's a big deal. This is one that I always talk about, that I struggle with. I don't mind saying that. Yes, I pray, but I'm not what you would consider a prayer warrior. You know, somebody who just, I can study like crazy and I love to study. But when it comes time to putting it all away, when it comes time to not just using prayer and Jesus as a cosmic Santa Claus (laughs) and and a wish list of things that, hey, could you keep me safe doing this? Could you keep my kids safe doing that? Could you keep us healthy? You know, all that stuff. But actually crying out to him, to refine me, crying out to him with a laundry list of things I need help with, crying out with the praise and the blessings like the verse we read not too long ago about how God actually does that. He praises over us. He sings and rejoices over us. 
the purpose of all of this, friends, the purpose of all of this is so that we can reflect the image of God. The image of His Son, Jesus Christ, would be reflected in us. His love, His forgiveness, right? That, that the world will see a difference in us. That our trials by the refining process in our time of, it can be suffering, it can be hard, accomplishes His work. I read a story this week in closing of a Bible study that was looking into the process of silver and gold refining, specifically silver. And one of the women in the small group was like, hey, I got a friend. Like, you know, I have a friend who does pottery, uh, Aaron Cole at the uh, Jackson campus. He does pottery and he's a master potter. <laughs> His nickname is the Harry Potter. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, but, you know, we'll do something with Aaron doing that. So, I mean, the, 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 you can, you can kind of, it's the same deal with that. Here, she knew someone like Aaron, but he did silver refining. And so she recalls that she went to sit in. She got an appointment and she went to sit in as he was doing his work, you know, a few weeks later. And she didn't tell him any of the reasons why she was there. She just said she was, you know, curious about the refining of silver. And so she watched him as he held a piece of silver, you know, like that video over the fire and started refining it. And when the flames were the very hottest, he would intently, you know, watch. And he would know right when that color was about to change. And, and then he would take it away as to not consume the silver, but just at the right time and get rid of the impurities. And this woman recalls as that was happening, thinking about God holding us in such a hot spot sometimes. <laughs> but not so that we burn, but as he sits as a refiner of purifier of silver. Take us out of those flames at just the right time. To change us. To take us to the next spot in the refining process. And she, she asked him as he was doing this if it was true that he had to, because, you know, she knew the Bible and they had talked about this Bible study, how God sits carefully as a refiner. She said, is it true that you have to, you have to sit there and you have to pay that close of attention or you'll lose the whole deal? Because if you leave it in the flames too long, it's going to be destroyed. And she asked them, and they were silent for a moment. And she said, I guess what I'm asking is, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? Like, when does this process stop? Because it seems in that video, it seems like you know, it could go on forever. How do you know when it's stopped? And the silversmith, no joke stopped everything and smiled at her and he said well this is that's easy that part's the easy part she said well how do you know when you're done and he said when i see my image in it reflected back at me whoa and i thought oh that's too good to be true you know just because the bible says that and then i looked into the situation and that is indeed what happens with silver the refiner will sit and wait until they can see the reflection in it. What an incredible image of what God wants from you and I. Would you pray with me? God, here we are. There's one church and one people who we come here with dirty ropes. <laughs> we come here uh, with a laundry list of weaknesses, of temptations, of sins, of trials. God, give us the courage to welcome your refining process into our lives this week. We know you're ready to refine us as individuals, but also as a church, North Rock Church. You're ready to do something big here. I believe that with all my heart. But we need a firm foundation. And we need it full of people who are willing to walk through the fire but not be burned. God, there are some here in our, in our presence right now that have never taken that first step to call you Lord and Savior. So with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, I want to ask those of you who have never done this, you believe that Jesus Christ 
died on that cross and shed that blood and wants to refine you, wants to see his image in you, you can get that fresh coat of paint right now, friends, with all eyes closed, all heads bowed, if you're ready for that change and you believe in him, pray this prayer in your heart after me. Dear Jesus, I believe that I am full of sin and I could never get to heaven no matter how many good deeds I do. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross and rose again three days later. I place my faith in you. Jesus, come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Give me that fresh coat of paint. Start the refining process. I give it to you. You have my heart. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.